Hey everyone, so I think we'll kick this off. My name's Adrian Randolph, Dean of Weinberg College, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Uh, I have the joy of hosting these events, uh, these investitures, and it really is a very special time. And I think it's always special, but it's especially nice when you, I don't know, have worked with uh, colleagues, such wonderful colleagues, and so deserving of this award. I guess they always are. I always say that to everyone, but it's especially pleasurable uh, for me today. Uh, so we're going to begin uh, the, today's ceremony by honoring Karen Alter, Norman Dwight Harris Chair in International Relations. And first, and this is our tradition, I'll say a few words about the chair itself, and then a representative, in this case the Chair of Political Science, Will Reno, will come up and introduce Karen herself. So the donor of this chair, Norman Dwight Harris, was a scholar of Africa and Asia who organized Northwestern's political science department in 1915 and chaired it until his retirement in 1928. Uh, chairs don't serve quite so long as they used to uh, 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 in the good old days. He's regarded as a pioneer in the study of what is now the field of international relations. Professor Harris came from the eminent Chicago Harris family, which also donated monies for Harris Hall, and Stanley G, the Stanley G. Harris Chair. I'd now like to invite Karen's colleague, Will, Professor Will Reno, to the podium to introduce Professor Alter. All right, well, it's a delight to be here and I'm glad to see some of our colleagues from political science and uh, I think Introducing uh, Karen Alter, I think she's probably known to a lot of you already, and, and um, it's a great pleasure on behalf of the department, though, to present you uh, with Karen Alter here today. And um, I would have to say, in introducing Karen, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the extent to which, throughout the years, Karen has been one of our integral links um, outside of Northwestern University. We talk about globalization and, you know, building institutional links and so forth and, and um, see a lot of effort put into it. But, you know, looking at, at Karen's career over the last, uh, what, two decades now at Northwestern University, I mean, one of the things that's really impressed me and uh, a lot of Karen's colleagues is uh, the extent to which she's built up uh, real institutional, I think human links as well, uh, with the University of, of Copenhagen's um, uh, School of Law. And uh, also when I think of Karen, uh, I also think of her um, <laughs> Twitter feed. Uh, one of the few academics who I think does a pretty good job of keeping up with it. <laughs> so uh, I encourage you to go there. And one of the things that you'll find uh, pretty recently is, is notification of a translation of one of her books, um, and you'll have to, to buy it. Uh, it's Trasplante Juridico de Tribunals Internacionales. Is that, did I do that right? Uh, <laughs> did you understand that? All right. Well, you should buy the book. And <laughs> It's all about access, okay, but you can also buy uh, Karen's books in other languages as well. And, and uh, uh, But, I mean, one of the great things about this is it's another opportunity for these types of links outside of Northwestern University, and in this case, uh, it was a book launch in, in Bogota, Colombia. So, uh, but, but also as her department chair, I think about Karen in terms of uh, the role that she played. Uh, <laughs> When I became chair, they didn't tell me about this pandemic thing. That wasn't in the contract. However, I was extremely grateful, uh, particularly during the uh, spring and summer of 2020 and the events, um, not just surrounding the pandemic, but also uh, the murder of George Floyd and, and so forth. And Karen was a leader in a lot of the department's activities at that time and, and um, I think was, was also uh, seen as, as a mentor and somebody who is very energetic around these issues. And, and this is something that I heard particularly uh, among the graduates uh, students. So I'm very thankful and grateful to Karen for that. Um, I also see her students uh, active in all sorts of, of different venues. And I think of G. Lee, for example, at uh, UC Irvine School of Law and 
Chris, Ari Shaw now at UCLA, and, and uh, so Karen's got a lot of great students and is, is building a network. So I think that uh, when I think of an endowed chair, uh, it's, it's, it's somebody who's not just prominent at Northwestern University, but also prominent in the world. Uh, I go to different events, and it's, it's interesting, oh, Northwestern University, hmm. And then usually a name pops up, and uh, quite often it's Karen Alter. So, uh, Karen, I think uh, that this is an honor. This is very well deserved. I'm, I'm proud to represent the Department of Political Science and and all of Karen's colleagues, uh, students. Uh, we've known about this and talked about this for quite some time now, and and um, I'm just delighted to be here. And uh, I think I've uh, run past my three minutes and. Um, I'll be disciplined about it. So. <laughs> What's the stage direction? Move over there. Yep. We're going to take some pictures. You set the standard of nimbleness. Okay. So I'm going to explain how I got, we were asked to explain how we got to here, and I think most of you will learn stuff about me that you did not know when I tell the story. So this is my mom and her partner, Heinz. When my mom grew up, the men made all of the decisions, and she grew up in a family that pretty much discriminated against women. Her brother was able to do things that she was not able to do. She probably had the same learning disabilities that I had, my sister had, and uh, she never, she, she didn't think of herself as smart because of these disabilities. She was definitely not a free damn feminist, but she had heard, no, you can't do this too many times. And as a mother of three daughters, she was committed to us having opportunities that were denied to her. What upset her most was that she was not allowed to travel, and so she made our household a very international household, and we traveled quite a bit. One of the first things she did was we had Lena Anderson, who stayed with us from Sweden when I was in elementary school. Uh, and because we had Lena in our family, then I wanted to be an exchange student. And that's actually a recent picture of Lena, because she lives in Malmo, Sweden, and I see her quite often when I go to Copenhagen. We hang out together. My mom told me that if I learned French, then I could be an exchange student in France. So in seventh grade, I started taking a bus from my middle school to a Catholic high school and taking French lessons so that I could go and live in France, which I did when I was in eighth grade, in this little farm town called Rue en Champagne, on this farm that most of the brothers and sisters were gone. They came back for a wedding, seven brothers and three sisters. Um, because I was taught French by Catholic nuns, I was speaking very formally to everybody there. <laughs> I had to learn the tutoyer while I was there. Um, but I also started reading voraciously because there wasn't a lot to do on this farm. Um, so that was my first experience and I kind of caught the bug and I knew I wanted to do it again. So my second experience was after my junior year of high school when I was an exchange student in Japan. And I was an exchange student on the program AFS. You don't get to choose where you want to go. And so therefore language skills are not a prerequisite. They tell you about six weeks before you go where you're going. So I quickly tried to learn some Japanese. Uh, and again, I was in a very small town, a rural town, uh, outside of Fukuoka was the biggest city, which was about an hour away. This is not a picture of the town. I lost my entire scrapbook from that trip, but it looked a lot like this. And I had one of those school uniforms, but back in my day, they would inspect it had to be below the knee. And so I would get on a bicycle, and I would take the bicycle to the train, and then I would get on the train where I was this giant girl American with curly hair, and the entire train would be silent. And uh, then someone would get up the courage and say to me, hello, and I would say hello back, and the entire train would laugh. And everywhere I went, I would hear these rumors, gaijin, 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 which means foreigner, um, which 
you can see, I was looking at YouTube videos, they don't think it's a racist statement, and it, maybe it's not a racist statement, but it certainly makes you feel very other while you're there. So it was a very transformative experience, but not one that made me want to invest further in Japanese or in Japan. <laughs> When I came back from that experience, I thought homes should be shared with people from around the world. And this is Olivier Saban, who was looking for a home in our high school. He was from France. Um, as you guys know about the community college initiative, he later went to community college and then to UCLA, and he's now a doctor in um, California. But I thought you should just welcome people in your home. I thought learning and speaking foreign languages is not very hard, that I was very good at math and just terrible in writing because of my learning disability. So correct spelling and multiple choice tests were just hopeless endeavors for me, as was the SAT. Um, and I thought no matter how hard I work, I will always be a B plus, A minus student because when you write in your fullest spelling mistakes, they think you're not very smart. But I also thought that I can study whatever I want, that, that my aptitudes were not going to define what I could and could not do. Spelling's hopeless, so that's not going to be a limit. And that I wanted to spend a year living somewhere else. Six weeks, 10 weeks, that was not enough. Uh, but not Japan, so I started studying Italian in college. And I also was working from the time that I was 13, because while my mom said yes to a lot of experiences, she said no to many other things. But if you had money and a job, there was fewer things you could say no to. So I always had a job. I went off from Los Angeles to New York to Cornell University. That was where my father went. And I was also a gaijin there, too, because I was this crazy Californian and I dyed my hair lots of colors. I had no idea what I wanted to study. Um, computer science was the one that I invested in the most. And I took a, a year off. My kids know that I'm a big fan of a year off. And that was where I really figured out what I wanted to do in life. So my year off, I was living in Italy. I'd studied Italian for two years. And I was living with Carlo and Aldo Boneschi, who were grandparents of an AFS student in, in my hometown. And I spent a lot of time with them. And they were really fantastic. Some of the things I did when I was in Italy, I taught English, that was my job. And uh, this is my friend Mara, who I met through teaching English, and my sister Anne, who came to visit me there, and we went to Napoli. And that's the boneschi Merzagora family who took me in, and they were like my family there. I played on the Italian national frisbee team, and we went to tournaments <laughs> in Switzerland. We stayed in um, bomb shelters. That was actually uh, halftime during a football stadium where all those people, no one came to our tournaments with all those people. Um, <laughs> But it was a group of people, and I was very into Ultimate Frisbee. Um, and so those were some of the fun experiences that I had. But what was so transformative to me intellectually was I learned what it meant that Sylvia and Aldo Boneschi were bourgeois anti-fascist resistance fighters. Because the myth of the resistance was it was all working class and all farmers. And, so, and, and it was the elite who was supporting Mussolini. So you're both ostracized from the elite who are still supporting Mussolini and from the working class people who assume you're supporting Mussolini. And so that was very shaping of who they were, and they imparted that to me. While I was there, that was where the first big terrorist attacks were going on, the Fumacino Airport in Rome, and then the seizing of the Achille Lauro, which led to almost a military conflict between um, the US and Italy uh, for many reasons. Uh, in that, Leon Klinghoffer was killed because he was American and he was Jewish. He also happened to be handicapped. I also had a boyfriend at the time. That's the best way to learn a language. Um, and he wrote in his phone book, Karen Jewish. That's how he identified me, which was really kind of startling to me. The nuclear accident of Chernobyl happened, and you'll hear why that's important in a moment. And my then Cornell mentor wrote me an inappropriate letter noting that we will be chatter. And he tried to visit me over there, to which I said no. I got off easy. That was the end of it. He was eventually fired for stalking an undergrad. But these were very shaping experiences for me. So when I came back, two more years of college, I thought I have a lot to learn about history, about class, about politics, and that even if I don't feel particularly Jewish, that others are going to define me by the fact that I am Jewish. I realized I have nothing in common with my American peers because they're fundamentally uninterested in the world, and I'm fundamentally interested in the world. That I needed a new academic mentor who was safe. So I picked Peter Katzenstein, and political scientists will know he's very, very famous. But I picked him because his wife worked in the department, and that meant that he would be safe. Uh, <laughs> Professor Katzenstein convinced me that to understand the world, I really need to understand economics. So I took eight economics courses. I, probably, I was practically an economics major. 
But I was a major in political science with certificates in history, European history, international relations, and I wrote an honors thesis, which I'll tell you about. But I wanted to go back to Europe for free. So I spent my career exploration trying to figure out what you can do if you speak a bunch of languages. These are the people who really taught me how to think and who made me the scholar that I am today. So Peter Kassenstein was my undergraduate thesis advisor. And I had a crazy ambitious thesis, not only because it was an ambitious thesis, but also because I blew out my knee playing uh, Ultimate Frisbee before I left and showed up a couple months before in a cast from my thigh to my ankle. And by the time I went off to do field work, I was in this huge brace limping around. But he's a very eclectic thinker. And Suzanne Berger then became my dissertation advisor. She taught me how to think. She taught me how to write. She taught me that everything comes down to the choices we collectively make. And if I drive our dean and our provost crazy by asking for things, you can blame Suzanne Berger because she said it all comes down to the choices that you make. And that's what politics are about. Both of these scholars are also very into politics and not super into methods. It's the political questions and the politics that really drive everything. So my undergraduate thesis was French and Italian responses to the nuclear accident. And that circle is where I was during the radiation fallout of Chernobyl. And I, my parents were visiting, so we went from Italy to France. And in Italy, you were sweeping up your dust in garbage bags and washing your hands and not petting animals and not eating any leafy vegetables. And in France, you were just hanging out like nothing was going on. So my question was, how could France's government so obviously lie and get away with it? And uh, there was a chance to go to Europe for free with a $2,500 Ford Foundation grant for Cornell undergrads. And Peter Kassenstein put me in touch with Dorothy Nelkin, who, if you guys know, is a sociology of science. And she gave me her contacts. So I was like meeting with scientists and with journalists and with government officials because I had Dorothy Nelkin's letter of introduction and list. I made my own contacts as well, and I was doing these inter interviews in Paris and southern France and northern Italy, down in Rome, trying to figure out why the Italians didn't lie and why the French could get away with lying. That was my undergraduate honors thesis, but I always wanted to go back to Europe for free. So after graduation, this Ford Foundation grant was a grant to Cornell, but, and I, this is my theory, was that the, the professors wanted to get the hands on money that was fundamentally dedicated to undergrads. So they put together this team research project. It was John Weiss's project, The Portrayal of the Resistance in French and Italian Post-War Films. And David Ward was then a uh, film student, graduate student. He's now a professor at Wellesley. And we went and saw a lot of really awful films and interviewed the people who worked in the films and the directors of the films. And these films were the portrayal of the resistance as, as France and Italy liberated themselves. And it was the workers who liberated themselves. So it really connected to what I was learning with the Boneskis of how this myth-making uh, of, of the resistance. So I did that, and that might be one reason why I'm so open to the humanities was that project. So when I graduated and applied to graduate school, well, first, these are the countries that I invested in. I learned German in graduate school. And what do they all have in common? They're major participants in World War II. So it's not a surprise that I was very shaped in my thinking by World War II. Um, but what I thought when I went to graduate school was, I need an advisor who's a good person and who will not sexually harass me. And that's one of the reasons I went to Suzanne Berger, who's a fantastic human being. I went to study European politics, political economy, and international relations. And I thought, well, this way I can use the languages that I have. And that I'm going to learn whatever I need to answer the questions that interest me. And that included learning German and learning a lot about law. So my early career, I would call myself quite an anomaly in some ways, but in others not at all, and an interdisciplinary transgressor. So I had a PhD in political science from MIT, which nobody associates with political science. So they thought that was kind of weird. It's actually a very sociological department. I became an expert on European law, but when I go over there saying I'm from MIT and I'm a political scientist, it's like saying you're a gym teacher studying European law. They have no expectations for you at all. I had to learn a lot about law and that the book is very legal in many ways. For many years, legal scholars thought I was a heretic because what I was doing was applying very straightforward comparative politics approaches to studying legal politics in a part of the world where there was no people studying legal politics. Only in the United States did we study legal politics. And they thought I was really rather crazy and making some arguments and assumptions that were so outside of the field of law. Um, my book in 2014 was then comparing international courts, which again is pretty standard fare for political science and pretty crazy for the law world. 
So the other part which Will mentioned is this i -Courts grant that they, um, they tried to hire me at i -Courts, and that's how I got on the grant from the very beginning because this was a center that studied comparative international courts so it was really building directly off my research and I was very happy to turn my research agenda over to i because I wanted to move on from studying international courts. I became a permanent visiting professor which is a complete oxymoron but that's the title <laughs> that, that Northwestern would let me have. They wouldn't let me have um, you know, research professor there. Um, so I was a visiting permanent professor. And for 10 years, I was written into the grant. And they bought off one of my classes. And they gave, I had an unlimited research account. And I really worked with the director, Mikhail Rask Matson, a sociologist, and Henrik Palmer Olson, who we call Palmer. Uh, and the three of us really created the structure for i -Courts and the plan of what was going to happen. I brought into that Larry Helfer, who's a longtime collaborator of mine, um, one of my best friends. We finish each other's sentences. We can't remember who said what. Uh, sometimes we call each other academic spouses. Uh, and I created the Summer Institute over there, which is still going on. I'm going to go to in a couple of weeks. So this was the team at i -Courts, And I have a whole other life at i -Courts that kind of no one here really knows about. These are some of the projects that I did. And they're really expensive. So <laughs> the International Human Rights Court of ECOWAS, West African, and, and Jackie McAllister was a graduate student of mine, now a tenured professor at Kenyon College. She did that project with us together. Backlash against international courts in West, East, and Southern Africa. All of this is based on field work, uh, going and talking to people. And all of that was paid for by I courts, uh, always with, mostly with Larry Helfer, uh, with James Gath, he's a third world approaches to international law scholar. And then I did a number of, of big projects through I courts. This international court authority, we had three conferences. It had scholars from around the world and different disciplines. Um, this is the translated book that just came out. That was. 10 years of my research with Larry Helfer uh, that was now translated and is, is going to be open access and going to be posted on the Andean Tribunal's website. And then the last project, which we just finished, was international courts adjudicating megapolitics. So a lot of my research for the past 10 years has been supported by them. This Chinese and Western perspectives on the rule of law, because I've become very interested in China. And they paid for my trip to go there and explore. And that's with Ji Li, who will mention, a former graduate student. because I will. I usually speak the language when I do research. Um, I had a Spanish translator for the Spanish part, even though I can fudge my way a lot. But I won't write on China unless I'm doing it with a China expert who speaks the language. So that's some of what I did there. What I'm known for as a scholar is still European Union legal politics, comparative international courts, this thing called international regime complexity. And my newest areas are backlash politics and global capitalism and law. And I'm just starting to get known for working in those areas. But fundamentally, who I am is that I'm a puzzle-driven scholar, empirical puzzles that don't make sense to me in the world. And that very much comes from Peter Katzenstein. And then I develop a lot of expertise on the topic. I read very widely history, anthropology, sociology, law. Then I go in the field and I interview people. And if things don't make sense to me, I figure they're smart and they're doing something for a good reason. So I just don't understand the good reason that it makes sense to them. And so I really get into understanding the alternative viewpoints. In what world does something like turning a, a, an economic court into a human rights court make perfect sense? Everything is a choice. That's something I learned from Suzanne Berger. And most things are possible more than you even imagine are possible, which is also something. You can be an economic court and become a human rights court. You can believe that slaves are not um, enslaved people are not the same as you to believing that they're absolutely the same as you. Everything can be politically instructed and changed. Thank you. I realize we were in Italy at the same time, and Chernobyl. We'll have to talk about our experiences. Uh, next, uh, uh, we will honor Franz Geiger. Charles E. and Emma H. Morrison Professor of Chemistry. Again, I'll just say a few words about this particular professorship. The first Morrison chairs were established in the 1940s with a bequest from Mrs. Emma Morrison, widow of Charles Morrison. And Charles Morrison was the son of a Chicago carpenter and contractor, Ezekiel. And he continued his father's lumber interests and carried on business in real estate before his death in 1916. We do not know what special connection the Morrisons may have enjoyed with Northwestern, 
but the gift came at an opportune moment for the university. In the past 50 years, the university has used the Morrison professorships to recognize outstanding faculty, faculty members in several fields, including chemistry, biology, and English. Charles Hurd of the Department of Chemistry was the first member of our faculty to hold a Morrison professorship in 1949. So I'd now like to invite my colleague and Franz's colleague, Professor George Schatz, to the podium to introduce Professor Geiger. Uh, so I'm very delighted to have the uh, honor of introducing uh, Franz Geiger as the uh, new Morrison Professor of Chemistry. Uh, Franz is originally from uh, Germany. He grew up in Berlin, both before the wall fell and after. Uh, he went to uh, the Technical University of, of Berlin, and then after that, decided to change his life completely and go to graduate school uh, in the U.S., and he went to Georgetown uh, University. He uh, worked for uh, a he worked for a lady named named Janice Hicks, uh, and Janice um, was just getting into uh, a new technology at the time, the use of a method called second harmonic generation uh, to study the properties of interfaces. And in particular, she was interested in ice uh, crystals that occur in the polar stratosphere. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this was a new technology. It involves firing a high intense laser uh, at whatever interface you're studying, uh, and then looking for the tiny amount of light that ends up coming out of that uh, at twice the frequency, so second harmonic generation, uh, it turns out that that little tiny signal can actually give you and tell you a lot about what is at that interface. Um, fortunately for Franz, he got the experiment to work, okay, and so uh, that was a good background for him. Later, he went to MIT and was uh, a postdoc with Mario Molina, who was a Nobel Prize winning atmospheric uh, scientist, chemist, uh, who had done early work, which he got the Nobel Prize for, uh, related to the uh, ozone hole in the stratosphere. Uh, by the time Franz got to MIT, he was interested in the troposphere. So Franz did tropospheric uh, studies using techniques called mass spectrometry. Um, and then in 2001, we hired him here, okay? And Franz uh, decided that he would try to see if he could somehow make this second harmonic generation technique uh, into something that, uh, you know, had broader applications. Uh, so in addition to studying various problems in the atmosphere, atmosphere chemistry, uh, he's used it more broadly, having to do with problems associated with environmental interfaces, including uh, problems about water at, at surfaces and soil, things like that. He's become uh, a strong proponent and, uh, and advocate for environmental problems as a result of of uh, this growing background. It turns out laser technology has improved. It's easier to do these experiments. And over the years, uh, Franz's group has uh, contributed significantly to new technologies related to second amount generation and also a related technique called some frequency generation. Um, so Franz has done many other things. Uh, among other things, he recently wrote a paper that has to do with using uh, water waves, salty water waves, uh, on rusty iron surfaces as a source of energy. And so, uh, you know, there will be a new type of green energy that relates to that, which we hope will come out of this work. Um, Franz uh, has had a lot of female graduate students uh, over his career uh, who have gotten PhDs, uh, which for chemistry is, is not a common thing. Uh, but Franz is, is I think, uh, the, the best in, in the chemistry department as far as that's concerned. Um, I, have, I was the editor of the journal Physical Chemistry for many years. Uh, in uh, 2014, uh, I appointed him as a senior editor underneath me. Thank you, Franz, okay, for making life better, okay, uh, as a result of that in many ways, among others, uh, getting us more involved in, in environmental science-related uh, types of, of publications. Um, all right, so it turns out that uh, the chair of the department, Terry Odom, uh, couldn't be here today, but turns out she sent me something to say uh, to, for this event, okay, and she says, okay, what I appreciate about Franz okay, is that he is someone who is all in on his convictions, uh, whether this concerns his belief for how best to care and mentor graduate students or for advocating 
uh, colleague recognition uh, and championing the importance of diversity, uh, his leading scientific efforts of environmental and, uh, is his, and his leading scientific efforts of environmental and social impact. Franz is someone who aims to translate his convictions into action, and we all benefit from this dedication. All right, thanks, and Franz. The last time I was in this um, lecture hall was wa when my colleague Emily Weiss was appointed the Mark Ratner Chair. So it's very sweet to be uh, here in the same spot. Um, I grew up in Berlin, as George mentioned, in the 1970s. And one of my first recollections from school must have been somewhere third or fourth grade or something like that was uh, we walked in to the classroom and the teacher had a piece of chalk in her hand and drew a circle on the chalkboard around a small structure that looked like the outline of the city of Berlin. And she said, Berlin is an island in the Red Sea. And I grew up in West Berlin. We were essentially surrounded by people with weapons pointing at us. Uh, and uh, that was the indoctrination that we ended up getting uh, on the western side uh, in Berlin. Uh, that was true. You would walk through the city, and in downtown Berlin, you walk down a, hall, uh, a uh, city block, and you couldn't walk further because there was a wall. Uh, and for those of you who have seen this and visited Berlin uh, in the, before the wall came down, you, you know what that looked like. But for those of you who haven't, it's, you literally have a 10-foot tall structure in front of you that you cannot scale. It was designed specifically. This was version 5.0 or something that went through the city center. Uh, and if you tried to get your hands on it, I mean, we were in the west. We didn't want to go into the east. But the folks in the east wanted to come over. Uh, you couldn't grip. Okay, So this was not scalable. This had been engineered by German scientists uh, in the 1950s. And uh, you know, it kept people behind that wall. And behind that wall were, were dogs and armed guards and searchlights and machine guns and mines. And um, when we were at friends, very often that were close to the wall on a weekend or something like that for a dinner party, we would hear them go off. And that you know happened at 10 o'clock at night. At 11 o'clock at night, you would hear these gunshots. And then the next morning, you would read about the names of the people that got shot at the wall. Okay, there were hundreds of them. So we forward to the uh, uh, 1980s. Uh, and during that time, we were taught, because there were new Pershing missiles that were put into West Germany by the Reagan administration. Uh, and we were taught uh, how to uh, find uh, the nearest shelter, fallout shelter. Uh, and then we realized that there was really no time to ever get there. Uh, we ended up uh, finding out later that we had most, the most uh, nuclear warheads pointed at Berlin from both sides uh, in any, than any other place in the world. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm mentioning this here because we are dealing with a situation that's very, very difficult and complex in Ukraine. Uh, and um, I have not heard the term nuclear war more often than this year in my entire life. Okay. So this is deeply on my, on my mind. So what did we do in that environment? The city, Berlin, literally never slept. Uh, it had a lot of things to offer, and so we took advantage of that. Uh, and um, nine years later, the wall came down in 1989 on the 9th of November. So I remember that day very well as well. Um, this was a Thursday evening. It was actually a mistake by one of the uh, leaders of the East German government. 
when he was asked in the last minute of a two hour long press conference whether or not the wall, uh, whether or not the barriers are gonna be open, uh, he, he said, uh, without really putting too much thought into it, yes. And that was the moment everyone ran to the wall uh, from East Germany. And it wasn't clear that an order had been given to the border guards to open the gates. And there was a moment where this whole Thursday night could have turned into a giant massacre, but no one, none of the guards shot. They opened the gates, and that was the beginning of the end of, of that history. So on Friday morning, uh, my colleagues and I, my student, co-students, co were all uh, in, in uh, 12th grade. We're um, in chemistry class. So we had a chemistry class that I took during my concentration. Uh, always started at 8 o'clock. There were lab lectures, etc. cetera. Uh, there were, must have been like 20 of us students or so. And our uh, teacher, uh, Frau Graz was her name, she was always on time. She was very strict. She was very uh, a tough grader, especially with stoichiometry and so on. And we were wondering, why is this woman not in the classroom? What's going on? And finally, at about 9 o'clock, we were, we were in class. We were actually starting to do experiments. Back then, you could do that without supervision. We knew what we were doing, we thought. She comes in at 9 o'clock. She says, stop everything. What are you doing? Go to the wall and see history being done. And uh, so we did. We grabbed our bikes, and then we saw champagne being poured over these uh, little Trabant plastic-made cars uh, for the entire weekend. It was awesome. During that time, I also played trumpet in the JJBC, is what it's called, uh, the Jugend Jazz Band Charlottenburg. So it was, it was a, a youth uh, jazz band. And during that time, we landed a gig at the hottest club in town. This was the Knack Club Berlin, which is in Prenzlauer Berg. And, um, you know, that is essentially the area that's now evolved Berlin to be the hottest club seen town in the world. So uh, that was a paid engagement for the first time. Okay? We had, had plenty of opportunities to show our, uh, um, our, uh, our music, but we were never paid. And here we were going to get paid. Every one of us was going to get $200, uh, 200 marks. But the problem was they were the East German marks. So this is aluminum <laughs> coins. Aluminum coins and, and cheap paper uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bills, okay, made from cheap materials that you could really tell the thing fell apart in your hand. And the other problem was that this was the weekend, the Saturday, before the Monday of the German uh, monetary unification at which the East German mark was going to disappear. <laughs> this was 10 years before the euro, and we were not going to have any opportunity to, to spend this money. Okay, so this was a bittersweet moment. We tried to get rid of it the next day by trying to buy anything, really, in East Germany. Uh, caviar, uh, juice, and um, books. We went to bookstores, cigarettes, anything. No one would sell us a single thing. All the shops were closed. They said, we don't want your money. We're going to wait until Monday, because then there was a conversion, uh, uh, conversion, conversion of the East German mark into the Deutsche mark. Okay was still the best show that we've ever played. That was really great. <laughs> As a high school senior, uh, I realize here that Karen and I have a lot in common, a lot more. We served on a, on a pretty long haul uh, uh, college committee for six years together that the dean was uh, selected us for. Let's put it this way. And, and, and so we got to know one another a little bit while our families were at home uh, waiting out these long nights going over cases for promotions and so on. And um, uh, just like Karen, I also have a lot of international uh, uh, history in my, in my upbringing. As a high school senior, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a spot on an international exchange program, um, similarly to your AFS. In fact, my mother, uh, Eleanor, was the first AFS student to go from Germany into the United States, and she was in Rochester for a year. And uh, so that, that was very interesting. Um, I went to Mexico City and was there during the time of Mexico City's worst air pollution. And my host family was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and there had, they had a daughter that went to Japan during that time. Um, and we were in the south of Mexico City, which was a beautiful part of the, of the, of the, of the town. Um, but there was a lot of driving because this is, you know, was one of the first mega cities. So the host family had license plates with even in odd days 
for the week permits. Okay, so on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday, Friday, you could drive this car. On the Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, you could drive that other car. And there were, of course, many people uh, who didn't have access to, to cars, so they bribed the cops. Okay, there's this thing called la mordida, that's the little bite, and so you just give the cop, you know, your 100 pesos or whatever it was at the time, uh, so that you wouldn't get uh, a ticket. Um, that's a really sad example of regulatory failure. But this was the first day uh, of, the, uh, rain, of the raining season when I was in the middle of the downtown Zocalo in Mexico City. And I have this experience in my head, it's burnt in, it was just awful because the, you know, all this rain came down and, and it was just filled, these drops were filled with soot. And all that soot landed on my skin and on my shirt and everything just, it, it sticks, it sticks to you like uh, uh, nothing really I've, I've experienced. It's pretty gross, it took a long time to get off. And so I thought I need to learn about this. I like the chemistry, right, that I had uh, that I'd done in high school. And so that got me into, into graduate school. The other option for me was music. Uh, but because I knew that I wanted to be abroad, uh, I figured there's a better chance to do that as a scientist. And maybe I could have been abroad too as a mm -hmm. musician. But back at the time, I, I figured science was the way to do it. So back in Berlin, I entered college, signed up for my undergraduate chemistry courses. Uh, I knew that I loved to be abroad, and so I applied for fellowships to the US and to the UK and won spots to study uh, right after my pre-diploma, which is two years um, of undergraduate. And then I recognized those programs were actually all largely limited to more coursework, and I wanted to do research. So I ended up turning those opportunities down. Uh, added one more year of advanced courses, that's like 300 and 400 level courses here at Northwestern, and then took the summer to visit uh, US chemistry departments um, up and down the East Coast where my parents had lots of friends. So nowadays, for those of you in the sciences, you know that we've got these visiting weekends and we spend a lot of money and effort on it and so on. Each time there come, might be 50 prospective or 100 prospective graduate students uh, that are coming to visit. I simply walked into departments and said, hi, I'm Franz. <laughs> can I talk to the physical chemists? Because I knew I wanted to do that. And people were so generous. And I remember having lunch with uh, National Academy members at Yale and Columbia University that just said, yeah, let's, let's take this guy out, you know, and uh, take him out for lunch. It's really wonderful. So at Georgetown, as uh, George mentioned, uh, I, I saw this program on ice surfaces and lasers and mass spectroscopy and stratospheric ozone depletion, and I was totally hooked. And uh, it's the only place I applied to, and thankfully I got in. Um, I reconnected with my Mexican roots in 1998 uh, as a, uh, at an American Chemical Society meeting where I met uh, Mario Molina. And uh, he had won the Nobel 1995 Nobel Prize along with the late Sherry Rowland and the late Paul Crutzen. So all three of them, unfortunately, have now passed away, which is very sad to see that uh, team is now on the other side because there hasn't been an environmental Nobel uh, since that 1995 event. I joined Mario's group, learned new techniques, brought those to Northwestern in 2001, and uh, here we are. I, you know, I can tell you about the science, but it's probably in the interest of time a little bit easier to uh, uh, let you read the papers. <laughs> so there's lots, there's lots to be thankful for, and uh, uh, I'm going to start with my wonderful wife, Jill. Uh, she and I, we met uh, in November 19th of my first year in uh, the United States. And I'm so grateful for your love and your commitment to us and our wonderful family that we've built. Um, we have Anya. She's in the audience, right there in the third row. She lives up to the German meaning of her last name, Geiger, which means violinist, because she's taking uh, courses. So she's really good here at the Bienen School. Uh, we have Valentine, um, right there, whose empathy is as evolved as their love and, uh, for art, uh, love and skill for art and uh, who is super excited about uh, joining ETHS this uh, fall. And then Maximilian Geiger was not able to come, unfortunately. He has really good saxophone and bass skills uh, also at ETHS, and so he's looking for his summer band camp. At Northwestern here, I'm really grateful for the late Morrison professor Jim Ibers, who was the chair who hired me. Without him, I, we wouldn't be in this room together. Uh, I'm also grateful to Mark Ratner, a Morrison professor who taught me how to teach general chemistry. I'm grateful to George Schatz, a Morrison professor who brought me into this inner sanctum of physical chemistry as a journal editor of our field. And I'm also grateful for uh, Rathman professor Chad Merkin, who wasn't able to come, but who has been a key mentor throughout my career here. 
I'm very grateful for my wonderful scientific collaborations here, especially with Charles Deering, McCormick Professor Regan Thompson, from whom you will hear it later. He's a very good friend of mine and great collaborator. I'm grateful for our undergraduate students uh, who have been studying quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, uh, and spectroscopy and kinetics with me. And this quarter, I'm seeing that being back in the classroom with them is truly group therapy. It's absolutely fantastic. Way better than this last year. And then finally, the late Rick Van Dyne, also a Morrison professor of chemistry, taught me early on, you're only as good as your very best graduate students. So I'm grateful for the PhD students who have been and are working in my group. And uh, Joe Hupp, a former uh, a, a Morrison professor, uh, told me that um, when I went up for tenure, he said, you know, your students are walking through walls for you. And as a kid who grew up with the wall, I really uh, thought that resonated a lot with me. To paraphrase Pima Laki from Seven Years of Tibet, which I watched recently again, the good fortune of your students is a blessing, so, so thank you. This uh, Charles and Emma Morrison professorship is such a blessing. And Dean Randolph, where are you? Right there, thank you. Thanks. I feel like we've got a trumpeter, we should start a band maybe on the faculty, maybe an ultimate Frisme uh, team, you know, is in the offing. So, uh, Ken, you're going to have to come up with some hobby we can build on uh, for the... So our final honoree of this afternoon is Ken Paller, the James Padilla Chair in the Arts and Sciences in the Department of Psychology. The James Padilla Chair is a bequest from the estate of James Padilla. He received his BA degree from Weinberg College in 1975. While at Northwestern, he was awarded an Illinois State Scholarship and graduated with departmental honors in history, finishing his degree in three years. Padilla was a partner in the law form, firm of Mayer, Brown, and Platt for over 20 years. He endowed a research fund in his name in the Department of History and has made contributions to the R. W. Leopold Professorship in the Weinberg College Alumni Fund. He was a member of the John Evans Club, the Henry Wade Rogers Society, and a charter member of the Wilson Society. I'd now like to invite my colleague and friend, Rick Zimbarg, Professor and Chair of Psychology, to the podium to introduce Professor Paller. So actually, Ken does play keyboard. Uh, and so you, you may have uh, some good pieces of your band already together. So uh, Ken, it is just a delight for me on many levels uh, to be introducing you for this honor. One of those related to that we've actually done a little bit of collaboration. And uh, as a result, I've had um, firsthand opportunity to uh, observe how brilliant and creative and rigorous you are. And um, uh, in terms of the collaborations that Ken and I have done, uh, they've been uh, mostly on some of his most research, uh, recent research involving uh, an idea that I and the field uh, and I believe our culture find fascinating. That idea being uh, that Ken uh, can direct the information that people uh, rehearse in their sleep. Um, so that part of his research um, I have some understanding of and can speak halfway intelligently about. Um, my understanding of much of the rest of Ken's research is uh, superficial at best. You see, because Ken uh, studies the human brain and um, uh, its role in our cognition, whereas I'm a clinical psychologist, and one of the few things that I know for sure about our brains are that they're located somewhere in our heads. Um, and uh, so I asked Ken's uh, neuroscience colleagues um, for some help in highlighting some of his other key achievements. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to Paul Reber, who I saw coming in earlier, uh, for uh, his help in this regard and will rely very heavily on Paul's generous notes to me for uh, those pieces. So Ken began his research career carrying out some of the foundational research that established the highly influential memory systems framework. The core idea of this framework 
is that there is more than one kind of memory. So for example, um, a uh, particularly critically important distinction in this area among different forms of memory is that between implicit or non-conscious memory on the one hand and uh, explicit or conscious memory on the other hand. And Ken's early research contributed uh, uh, major findings supporting this idea based on completely novel methodologies using EEG recordings. One of the first forms of brain neuroimaging that can, that was brought to bear on human cognitive research and which can help to pioneer. Uh, these findings and the critical methodological in innovations that allowed for them helped define a field that has come to be known as cognitive neuroscience. Um, Ken's contributions to basic memory research would themselves reflect a remarkable career of influential work w worthy of the honor that he's receiving today. But his most recent findings have taken ideas about learning and memory in a brand new direction that has generated a lot of excitement. You see, there's a lot going on in the parts of the brain that support memory during sleep. And there's been a lot of speculation about why this is. A little over a decade ago, when Ken and the students in his lab started working on ideas about how to better understand the sleep memory connection. The theory was highly speculative and the methodological challenges seemed intractable. But Ken and his laboratory figured it out. They invented a very creative and clever way to direct the information that gets rehearsed during sleep and demonstrated robust improvements in these activated memories later when the research participants were awake. Uh, there are now labs all over the world using Ken's technique and largely as a result of his work, sleep and memory have become a key area of cutting edge research. Now, uh, in addition to his research throughout his career, Ken has also been well known uh, in our department and in the uh, Neuroscience Institute uh, as being an exceptional mentor of students and junior researchers within his lab. His lab has produced a truly remarkable number of highly influential scientists who have gone on themselves to high impact award-winning careers in cognitive neuroscience. And in fact, the broader community here at Northwestern has also benefited a great deal from Ken's talents in mentorship by his leadership for the past 15 years of the uh, National Institute of Health funded training program to train junior scientists in human cognitive neuroscience that extend well beyond uh, our department. Last but certainly not least in my mind, uh, Ken is a mensch. And um, uh, I'll stop there and uh, bring Ken on up to the stage. Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, those are very kind comments. Thank you, Dean Randolph. Uh, and thanks to everyone for being here today, uh, at some significant risk, perhaps, but thanks for being here right now, here today. Um, am I really here, Rick? Am I, or maybe I'm dreaming right now. <laughs> I could be dreaming. It could all just be a dream of fantasy in my mind. In fact, each of you could ask yourself the question, you know, am I sitting right now in Harris 107, experiencing reality right now? Or am I dreaming that I'm in Harris 107 while in the midst of a bout of REM sleep? Because how can you be sure? Usually when 
or in fact, typically for most dreams, if they aren't what we call lucid dreams, then it seems absolutely real the whole time. And it's only at the moment when you wake up that you figure out that it was fake, that not real at all. And when you wake up, then you know that your dream experiences were just produced in your brain, fabricated, they're counterfeit, fake, uh, not real. But I think it's the same basic brain process that allows us to have this normal waking experience and the seemingly real dreaming experiences, this feeling of presence, of being right here in the present moment uh, and, and feeling that everything's real. It doesn't require any of this stuff. It doesn't require this room. Uh, so our reality and our dreamed fantasy, they're not really that far apart. So what convoluted pathway led me to the science of consciousness, uh, of conscious memories and dreams? I'm supposed to tell you about that, but actually my agenda is more to clarify where the credit is due because accomplishments, they're, um, like what Rick mentioned, they result from groups of people. So what I want to do is um, uh, kind of go through a series of thank yous to quite a lot of people. And it will be challenging in 12 minutes to get to everybody who should be thanked, but at least it wasn't hard for me to figure out who to start with, and that would be Marcia Grabowiecki. She's also a psychology professor here and my wife of many years, and her, her love and support and understanding has been paramount. And you know, we both have these ideas of trying to understand the mind in general, as well as understanding our own minds. And uh, I still feel so fortunate to have Marcia as a life companion who not only holds the same values, but also holds the same inquisitiveness and passion for exploring the mysteries of the mind that pervades our work lives, our home lives, and our spiritual lives, really, and our worldview. So years ago, we moved to Evanston together, not for the benefit of her career, but just for the benefit of my career. But I hope her career at Northwestern has been equally worth it for the research, for the many students she's trained in her lab, and uh, for her very popular undergraduate course, she teaches on Buddhist psychology. And I remain grateful for so much, uh, including, of course, our sons, Devin and Jackson, and uh, for the grounding of our family foundation. You can only imagine the esoteric conversations that the two boys had to sit through at the dinner table. Uh, and speaking of family, uh, I'm also grateful to the ancestors. And here's two representative ancestors. Uh, these are my great grandparents, and I know practically nothing about them. But look, they're, they're each holding a book. And I think that, that must mean something. I think this uh, you know, value of learning has been passed down through many generations, I guess. And uh, so my grandparents, uh, the next generation, came to the US, that was about 100 years ago. And that was very fortunate. I'm very grateful that happened. Things weren't so good for Jews at the time where they were living in uh, small towns in present-day Belarus and Ukraine. And they got a lot worse for any Jews who stayed there. So fortunately, they came to the US. And the opportunities they found here came from the sacrifices of so many people from stolen land and stolen labor. And so it was possible for them, therefore, to escape and come here, and then for me to be born uh, and grow up in Los Angeles in a supportive family that uh, also valued education for me and my two brothers. I think one of them's tickling me right here at the moment of the shot. But I don't actually remember the, the photograph. So my education was entrusted to the LA City school system, which is the second largest school system in the US. And whether good things happen to a kid in school, well, that can turn on having even just one amazingly inspirational teacher. And that was the case for me. I had, I had good teachers, but by far the most inspirational teacher I had uh, was in 10th grade at Venice High School, this guy, John Bacho. And turns out, looking back, he really planted the seeds for my career choices and for much more in my life. So what subject do you think he taught me? I liked math a lot at school. But no, he, any guesses? He was, yeah, he was my English teacher. That's quite right. And uh, at the time in the classroom, Bacho was not a much-loved teacher. Uh, at first, all the students hated the class because he made us write countless essays 
and then rewrite them again after he marked them up with his red pen and gave us very low grades. And that was a jolt, and not many teachers take the effort to do that, unfortunately. And, uh, but he painstakingly taught us a lot about writing, uh, and Batchel worked hard to innovate, and he made a big impact. But uh, for the writing focus, yes, but really for me, because of the things he had us read, the things he exposed us to. And there were the usual suspects in lead English literature there, but he also had us read about some other topics, like altered states of consciousness. He had us read about Eastern philosophy and meditation. He exposed us to Piaget and concepts of language learning. And I was going through a, a folder I kept with some of the things from the class, and I was reminded that he also assigned a Scientific American article on perception and memory that must have had some impact on me. Uh, and, and then here's a big one. He had us read this paper published in Science Magazine, and certainly it wasn't written for high school students, and uh, yet it was a historically important paper by Norman Geschwind, a big force in neuropsychology at the time. And so Mr. Batchelor, he had us read about and write about lots of things including neuroscience, and he inspired us to more learning. And decades, decades later, I was very fortunate to reconnect with him. And I got to go back uh, to LA and, and have lunch with him quite a few times. He still lived in the same neighborhood and retired. He would sometimes tell me he'd be in the grocery store and someone would come up to him and say, Mr. Bacho, you changed my life. And so he really affected lots of students besides me uh, and had this really huge impact. And I, I remember now that graduation, I think for the past 10 years at Northwestern, has included this uh, nice tradition of honoring some of the high school teachers who have influenced uh, graduating seniors. And Mr. Batcho would certainly deserve uh, that sort of honor, too. Now, um, the same Norman Geschwind here, I, I believe, was my colleague Marcel Mesulam's mentor at Harvard. And Marcel uh, was moderating a domain dinner just last December, and we were talking afterwards, and he was telling me that um, given how important public education is for society, we should really be using all of our scientific knowledge from memory research, from Alzheimer's research, from whatever we can to try to see if we can find ways to improve public education. And so now I, I kind of know the secret uh, for excellent publication. You just have to make sure that each student has at least one Mr. Bacho, and that would do it. Uh, so now let me quickly express my gratitude to the many uh, undergraduate uh, professors and mentors who helped me. These are three representative ones. David Shapiro uh, let me do a project in his psychophysiology lab just when I was getting started. Frank Krasny taught a small seminar course for us and gave us advice, gave me advice in particular about my career. And uh, there were these first year seminar courses I took at UCLA that were also very important and helped me understand this overlap between neuroscience and psychology that got my interest early on. And then also really important working with Frank Burnett uh, in Canterbury at the wonderful junior year that I spent uh, abroad in the UK. So next I enrolled at the University of California at San Diego in the neurosciences PhD program. And I was quite fortunate there with mentors. I had two different mentors for my PhD, uh, Larry Squire and Steve Hilliard in two separate labs. And within their lab groups, of course, there were many other scientists as well, including Marta Kudis and other faculty members, I haven't listed them all. They're really a pretty long list I could have put there, including Ted Bullock and, and Pat Churchland. And what this, you know, the set of many faculty and, and the other students really gave us graduate students a real sense of community. We thought there was, you know, a lot of support for doing the graduate training in neuroscience we were doing there. And we were helped by many people. And uh, so we've worked to try to have that kind of uh, environment for the students here at Northwestern, too. Now, it was also at UCSD that it became clear to me that the territory of neuroscience includes mapping out this great divide. And I'm referring to the distinction between the conscious parts of our mind and the unconscious parts of our mind. And, and thinking about, well, what needs to happen in the brain to have this conscious experience, uh, such as a conscious memory with a first person perspective, or just the feeling of being here in a room, for example. And so I've carried on with those ideas learning more neuroscience methods as a postdoc, and I had a very circuitous route as a postdoc, uh, though actually having mentors, some of the same mentors I had met at UC San Diego with me as postdoc mentors, uh, and I've listed a few of them here. All that laid the groundwork for eventually coming to Northwestern and running my own lab, and 
I found several supportive communities here. One was in the psychology department, so people like Bill Ravel, Al Urbacher helped in the early days just getting settled and figuring out how to run a lab, which wasn't something you're exactly taught uh, in graduate school. And, uh, but the psychology department wasn't the only uh, community. There's also this distinct community, the neuroscience community, across many departments. And there are many faculty there uh, who also helped me out. And uh, within neuroscience, uh, another unit was the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center, uh, run by Professor Mesulam and Sandy Weintraub. And uh, they generously worked with me, helped me expand my research into Alzheimer's disease and related issues. And then, as Rick mentioned, in, in more recent years, now I'm studying sleep as well. And so it was very helpful to have these two sleep centers uh, and, and the, the people there to help support that kind of expansion of my research, Phyllis's Center at the uh, medical school and Fred Turk's Center uh, here in Evanston. So I'm grateful for all these interacting communities and of course the great faculty uh, to work with. And, but really, of course, the students are the most vital component. And so at this point, I wanted to highlight my evolving graduate, uh, uh, my evolving lab group through the years because it's been my grad students and postdocs and undergrads who've taken on the projects and produced all kinds of new research, new ideas, new thinking, uh, and who've taken on you know, projects, uh, you know, each of the steps of science where we basically take on a new project and learn the whole process together, part of the education and research kind of conglomerate that we engage in. And in the mix, I've been fortunate to have also a, a series of employees in the lab uh, but there's one in, in particular who stands out, I put her name at the top, Susan Florzak, because instead of just working for me for two or three years, uh, like most do, Susan Florzak started with a senior project when she was an undergrad here, and then stayed on with me full time for blah, 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 years. Uh, <laughs> and in the process became an expert at everything we do in the lab, including all the way up to the highest levels of scientific uh, thoughtfulness and experimental design. And I, so I really can't do justice to all her many contributions through the years. Uh, now, no lab can function without additional staff support, people who definitely deserve more credit and I'd say uh, more pay as well. And uh, there have been many people through the years. One representative person here is Tamika uh, Bullar, and uh, she's amazing. She really does the job of five people. And when I say that, you're immediately thinking, well, yeah, that's the typical kind of exaggeration. But no, she is really doing the job of five people because of all the people we don't have in the department at the moment, and she's doing all that work. And so people like her have been so critical, and I'm very grateful to all the people, uh, the students and staff through the years. Uh, I'm also grateful to one other professor who's been a collaborator with me on many projects and memory research. And, and we work together on, on so much memory research that sometimes people in my department confuse us, even though we don't look alike at all. Uh, but usually we study memory over short periods of time, like you know, minutes, maybe hours, few days. Uh, but some things take a lot longer to learn. And so Paul Reber was kind enough to invite me to study memory in a longer time frame, uh, and in an applied way outside of the lab. So the experimental question was, can an old guy learn new tricks such as uh, being a keyboard player in a rock and roll cover band. <laughs> and it turns out that yes, I could learn new things. And even thanks to Paul Reber's introduction to this, I've even been in another band shown on the right. This is a band called Pavlov's Dogs. And we play every year at the Society for Neuroscience meeting because that's the only time we're all in the same city together. Uh, and so this applied memory research has continued. You're all welcome to our next gig in Evanston if you'd like to come. <laughs> So if this was all a dream, I don't know, but I guess it's time to wake up because we don't want to miss the reception. So thank you very much. Thank you all for such terrific presentations. It's so interesting to learn about people's lives and the genealogy of how they came to places, both in terms of ancestors, but also in terms of intellectual genealogies. I wanted to thank our provost, Kathleen Haggerty, for attending. She'll be saying a few words uh, of toast later, but thank you for coming. It means a lot to our community to have you represent the university at these events. Uh, I'll just say a few words. I won't belabor it. Uh, I now realize I'm between you and the refreshments, so I'll be careful. Uh, but I did want to say it's so gratifying to come to these events where you hear about 
international relations and law, chemistry and the environment, the brains, the science of the brain and memory, in ways I think most of us don't usually hear that sort of cross uh, fertilization of ideas. I mean, maybe you do if you're undergraduates, because you probably experience our curriculum a little bit more in diversity than we do. And I find it really gratifying to hear of these uh, stories. Uh, I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, I don't want to be too pretentious, but, uh, you know, there is this wonderful thing that came to mind as Ken was talking, you know, the Shakespearean quote, we are uh, such stuff as dreams are made of, right? Or is that the expression? Uh, that, that really is I think underneath some of the things we heard today, that people dream to aspire to become things. And you see how those passages of thought when we're young people thinking through what we could be, and I think your stories are really testimony to what is possible. You know, you can think and dream and try, and it can uh, be realized. It isn't always realized, let's be honest. It's difficult, I'm sure we all, all can point to colleagues who didn't necessarily make it to this point of distinguished professorships, but it really is important to have those dreams, and I find myself refreshed listening to you. The second part of the Shakespearean quote is less often quoted, uh, our little lives are rounded with sleep. And I always think that's a very nice way of thinking about sleep for those of us who don't sleep well necessarily. It's nice to think of sleep as this rounding, sort of honing process. Uh, and I was thinking about, you know, the stories we heard. What is it that rounds our life? It's such a wonderful verb for those of us who are in the humanities, you know, that idea of rounding something. And I thought, you know, community. You pointed to the people who make up your labs, your intellectual lives. And I think community rounds us in important ways. So I hope we can think about that. I think the way in which mentors, when that relationship is right and is not terribly wrong, as we heard in one of the presentations, it can be a wonderful thing. And it is a two-way street. You know, you need a good mentee and a good mentor. And I was thinking about that as we're going, you know, let's be conscious about that. And finally, I thought collaboration. We often, we were talking today in the, the office about something completely different, uh, but about how we're often put into competitive relationships. And there's something good about competition, don't get me wrong, I mean, that's there, but the heart of academia is collaboration. I think we saw evidence of that today, and you know, there are problems with academia, I'm not trying to say it's all perfect, but one of the things we can model for the world is good collaboration, open source, sharing of information, and, and being, uh, having a sense that we're working together rather than solely in a type of you know, death match with each other trying to win. That's important sometimes, but not always. And I was gratified today to hear about such wonderful stories about collaboration. So in those spir that spirit, let's go collaborate on uh, putting a dent in some of the food and drink we have in the next room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Friends, wildcats. Uh, we're gonna have a few toasts. You don't have to come too close if you can hear, but if you want to come closer to the action, feel free. Uh, I wanted to thank before uh, starting this, uh, Laura Dmitrovich, who is the events planner for the college, relatively new on our team and has done a wonderful job. And thank you all to the staff who are helping us with drinks and food. It's really fabulous tasting and in both regards. Uh, so my job is to introduce our provost, uh, Kathleen Haggerty, who is a professor, the first, oh gosh. First Chicago, I always forget which bank. Uh, the first Chicago professor uh, at Kellogg School of Management and is a wonderful colleague. Uh, she's also the provost of the university, the chief academic advisor, uh, advisor, first <laughs> chief academic officer of the university uh, and advises the president on all sorts of academic matters. Uh, and it really is a pleasure for have, to have her come to these events. It's uh, heartwarming that she sees a little window of some of the excellence on our faculty. So thank you, Kathleen. Well, thank you. Oopsie, Adrian's a lot taller than I am, so uh, we have to move this. Uh, thank you for including me today. I actually love attending these events, and one reason why I do is, you know, it's 
when I was in Kellogg, I knew everybody. And now that I have this job, I don't know everybody. And so I have to learn about everybody. And the way that I often go about learning about everybody is through events such as these. And it's kind of the one of the great things about So I learn about people through kind of random things. And then I learn about people by reading their promotion files. And I learn about people by attending events like this and attending teaching awards. So actually what I do is I see people in the most wonderful way because I see people um, being praised and awarded and given things and you're getting tenure and people write all these fabulous, you know, I think if you could just see the letters that people write about you, you would just, it would make, you would be so thrilled. And so I just see people in their most wonderful light. And so it's, you know, so I love it. And so it's, it's great to be here. And I also love biographies and I love history and I love hearing people's personal stories. And I, would ask people tons of questions in a way that's probably not appropriate, so I get to learn all this information without interrogating them. So um, I really enjoy it, and thank you for including me. Now, the endowed chairs are one of the university's ways of recognizing their most distinguished faculty. And each of the recipients tonight are leaders in their field, and they bring distinction to the university with their scholarship. And Northwestern is a wonderful university, and let's be honest, the center of the university is the faculty. Our mission is teaching and research, and who performs those tasks? The faculty. And people who get chairs are the tippy top of the group who do that. So this is a big deal, and I've, I've joked with Adrian that this is like the last thing there is to get. So, you know, there's an, there's an end of a certain kind of striving now because, you know, he, he doesn't like it when I say that, but it's true. And I actually remember that when I got my chair is that, you know, I can finally take my foot off the accelerator, which actually turned out not to be true, but that's how I felt it <laughs> on the day that it happened. And um, I know we've heard from tonight's honorees, and we're soon going to hear some more from their closest colleagues, which is also very fun. And I know everybody wants to hear those stories, so I'd like to first be the first one to offer a toast to Karen, Franz, and Ken on the occasion of this investiture. Their commitment to their profession has made our institution one of the best in the world. So to the four of you, a toast, and thank you for your work. <laughs> so the first up is Steve Nelson, who is going to offer a toast to Karen Alter. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to go off script. I've watched enough of the Academy Awards. I'm going to follow my <laughs> my paper. Uh, yeah, you, you, please, you know, uh, play me off. Uh, so I'm Steve Nelson. I'm an associate professor in political science. It's truly a privilege to have the chance to join you all in congratulating Karen. Receiving the Norman Dwight Harris Chair in International Relations is an extraordinary accomplishment and richly deserved. I was looking for you. There, I see you now. Uh, I want to use this time to say a bit about Karen's qualities as a scholar, as a mentor and colleague, and as a friend. And I'll start with the scholarship. One sometimes hears the terms path-breaking applied to researchers' work in our shared field of international relations. For that path-breaking appellation to be justified, scholars should strike out in directions that others could or would not because the difficulty of making progress in the face of uncertainty seemed too great. Path-breaking scholars are venturesome, and they're made of really strong stuff. And in my more than a decade now, well, that seems weird to read that out loud, more than a decade as one of Karen's colleagues, I've seen firsthand how those traits fueled the work that established her position in the field. Two things that I and many uh, others admire about Karen are first, the curiosity that motivates her. And we heard a lot about that uh, in her presentation. And second, the fearlessness that characterizes Karen's pursuit of knowledge. If you look at Karen's major works on the politics of international courts, you'll see her expertise encompasses courts in Europe, courts in South America, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Lots of people in our field want to establish a foothold and then more or less guard their territory. I get that. It's risky to move out of one's comfort zone and venture into totally new areas. But Karen's practice of scholarship is a model for how fearlessness and inquisitiveness can create lasting contributions and open new research areas. Karen's energy is another thing that makes her exceptional. I don't know where the energy comes from. If someone could find the source and bottle it and sell it, they'd become very rich very, very quickly. I'm sure others in this room maybe have better stories that attest to Karen's seemingly inexhaustible energy source, but here's one of mine, briefly. A couple years ago, we spent some days uh, in Geneva conducting interviews of officials at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. 
Karen's much better at interview-based research than me, so I just tried to transcribe the back and forth between her and the officials. After a few of these interviews and with jet lag hitting me, I was, I was ready to get a drink and to collapse, basically. And, um, but before leaving the WTO building, Karen said, okay, now we're gonna sit and rewrite the interview notes so that they can be useful, not just to us, it sounds like I'm insulting you, but I'm actually praising you. <laughs> Not just to us, but to other researchers. And both of us had to do it, so we had an accurate and tr complete transcription. It was just um, extraordinary to me to see how deep her energy reserves run. Karen has strong convictions and won't surrender them easily, running through her writing, her teaching, and her leadership as a set of core values. I recall our friend and colleague Christina LaFont once said in passing that Karen has the instincts of a political philosopher. She thinks about law and institutions in international politics, not as distant objects that can be studied with detachment, but as human constructs that people make and can remake and which have real and tangible implications for our lives. I also think it's important to recognize the mentoring work that Karen has done for many, uh, and especially for many women in the department, the university and the wider profession, her support for and investment in students and junior scholars it's consistent with the goal of identifying and rooting out biases and disparities. At difficult points in my career, I've been fortunate to get nudged in the right direction by Karen, and I've been even more fortunate to get pep talks when I need them, and I need them a lot, actually. Um, and I'm sure others here have had the same good fortune. So I'm lucky, as are many others at Northwestern account Karen as a friend. She sees and understands you as a multifaceted human being and can switch from high-level scholar to friendship mode easily. So I don't have my drink, but I would say, here's to Karen Alter for her achievements and attributes, and here's to Northwestern for bestowing this recognition. Cheers. Just because people can't clap for drinks from that. It, it seems a bit awkward, silent sometimes. Uh, so next we're gonna hear from Regan Thompson about Franz Gagner. Okay. For a toast. Oh, uh, I thought it was a roast. Roast, roast. Oh, uh, oh, uh, th this could go badly then. Uh, no, so, um, yeah, so I, I first met Franz actually when I was interviewing uh, here in uh, 2005, and um, I didn't think the day went very well. Uh, Franz is actually my last visit of the day, my la the last person I was meeting with, and um, yeah, I, I was pretty despondent. But uh, Franz seemed to uh, detect that and, and be aware of that and was really, really nice to me. Uh, was just was, was really kind. And I remember when he shuffled me out the front of tech and put me into a cab and I was on my way back to, on my way to the airport, I thought, wow, yeah, he'd be really great to have as a colleague. Um, and then somehow miraculously I got the job here and Franz became my colleague. And um, I think I was right that he's a wonderful colleague uh, he really cares for all of us in the department uh, as people, and he's really invested in building community in our department, and that, that's become really strong lately with uh, the pandemic. Now that we're back in person, the tradition of faculty lunch has kind of started to come back online in our department, and Franz is always emailing us every day saying, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be in K140 with lunch today, please come. So you go down and, and we have these wonderful lunches. So, you know, after a few years, Franz and I became uh, collaborators, um, not just uh, colleagues. And that actually was something that came out of this faculty lunch thing that we have. And you wouldn't think that someone like me, who's a synthetic organic chemist and a physical chemist like Franz, would have anything uh, in common with one another in terms of our research. Um, but I think it's a testament to Franz's creativity and his uh, scientific inquisitiveness that um, we have this really wonderful collaboration and I'm doing science personally that I never would have thought that I've been, would have been possible w without France. And I know that's, that's true for many of us uh, in, in our department. And so through all of this, you know, France is, is more than just a, a colleague and a collaborator, he's, he's become a, a really great friend. Um, and, you know, he's always willing to cut out of work early and go grab a drink and commiserate or celebrate together and is really generous of his time. Uh, and has invited me to be part of uh, what he calls his urban family. And uh, through that, I've gotten to know uh, Jill and, and the kids really well. 
And so uh, I was just super thrilled uh, that Franz was given this, this honor with this Morrison professorship. And so uh, please join me in, in, uh, in, in toasting a Franz, a, uh, a caring uh, a colleague, a creative collaborator, and a fantastic friend. So now we're going to hear from Marcel Metalon about our colleague, Ken Powell. So where is Ken? Ken. So uh, <clears throat> I have waited a long time to have this opportunity to propose a toast uh, at your uh, coronation. Uh, <laughs> So this is so richly deserved. And Rick has given this wonderful uh, talk telling us uh, why this is so uh, deserved. So I'm going to use my uh, two and a half remaining minutes just uh, with a, a recollection. So it's not really quite accurate to say that Ken Palish transformed the cognitive neuroscience landscape at Northwestern for the only reason that there was no landscape at that time to transform. <laughs> and uh, Ken was a real pioneer at a time when uh, cognitive neuroscience was at the stage of the Wild West and a little bit in doldrums. At that time, electrophysiology was suffering from lack of uh, spatial resolution uh, the beautifully uh, productive work in single neuron recordings in monkeys was coming to an end for very complicated reasons. Functional imaging with PET was the domain of the ultra-rich who could afford the cyclotron. And then suddenly, functional MRI came into the scene. This was like the revolution of the proletariat. Uh, <laughs> the m masses uh, got into cognitive neuroscience. And uh, at that time, I put together a group of a few fellow travelers into the cognitive brain mapping group. Um, uh, Paul Reber was among this very select group, and Todd Parrish, who is not here, played. I, maybe he came right after the cognitive brain mapping group actually was put together. But uh, at that time, we were allowed only two hours of functional imaging a week after dinner on Tuesdays. <laughs> and we were so destitute that we actually had to hand paint areas of activation after <laughs> fMRI experiments. So Ken's genius was really to take this cognitive brain mapping group, add to it the T32 uh, training grant, and bring together what I think is the most successful cross-campus collaborative program on cognitive neuroscience and uh, functional imaging. And this also allowed many brilliant scientists to be recruited so that Northwestern is now on the map when it comes to cognitive neuroscience. Now, there are many things that Ken has done, his laboratory has done, his colleagues have done that are very memorable. But I think above all of them, the one thing that will stick in our memories, whether while we're awake or dreaming, is the burrito. <laughs> now, some, many of you don't know what a burrito <laughs> means to cognitive neuroscience at Northwestern. Basically, in the data blitz sessions, you are eligible to enter a lottery for a burrito <laughs> if, if you complete your talk within the allotted three minutes. <laughs> so I <laughs> definitely want a burrito. So I'm going to stop here and toast Ken. Congratulations. Well, that was wonderful. Uh, I was going to try, uh, you know, given the linguistic uh, references, I was going to say sort of felicitations or something, and I thought gratuliere in France, but then I couldn't figure out what one says in Venice, California. Uh, you know, what, what would you say, cheers or way to go, dude? I don't know, sort of, 
what the vernacular of Venice is. Anyway, but congratulations to you all. Uh, it really was such a heartwarming event, and you all of the presenters deserve burritos because I think you stayed on time, which is, uh, I think, actually a gift to everyone as well. So congratulations. <laughs> Woohoo!